Everybody, we're back again here in the single digits of 2012. It's the Catholic Underground, which is the Catholic Podcast, which is also uh, where your Catholic faith meets the digital continent. I'm Father Chris Decker. Joining us, you can see him on either side. I mean, we've got Joshua LeBlanc from CyberCatholics.com. Hello, Joshua. Hello. And Father Ryan is nearly frozen in the other box. Uh, hello, Father. Hi, how are you doing, world? You can't see what I'm doing. Okay, I'm really quite happy. Hey. How, how do you feel about the new year? Uh, I mean, 2012, how was your Christmas? How do you feel about the new year? Well, I told everybody that if this is going to be our last year on Earth, that we better enjoy it. And uh, and I'm uh, we had a really, very really nice Christmas here. I got a chance to see my nephews and my family, and uh, it was beautiful. I'm, uh, I'm super excited about the new year. We got a lot of projects in the parish. And uh, I feel like a sportscaster who's saying a lot of good things that are stocked and canned phrases. So, yeah. <laughs> well, now, Father, you're actually going to become a, a mobile homeowner. Isn't that right? <laughs> well, we're going to be uh, we're gonna have to purchase a manufactured home to uh, replace our rectory, which is quite literally collapsing around me. Um, <laughs> in fact, the, the bishop I can attest joking. to the truth of that. I told the bishop, I said, Bishop, we, uh, we also have some imminent danger in the form of a giant tree limb hanging over the house. And he goes... How much do you think that place is insured for if it falls? <laughs> I had right. the same thought, but uh, no, no. That's right. You could almost pay for the uh, their 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 house. Uh, now, uh, now, Joshua, Joshua, you're actually uh, expanding beyond your conventional boundaries, house wise. Constantly. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, your office, your office. <laughs> how, how are you? Uh, how are you looking forward to 2012? Uh, you know what? It's uh, I'm really looking forward to this year. Um, I, I see only good things happening on so many different levels, some which we're going to talk about a little later in the podcast. But yep. There are so many things that, uh, that are happening. I'm staying even busier than normal, which sometimes can be a good thing. Um, but, yes, my office is expanding a little bit. We're getting ready to, to rent a little more space because I've, I'm outgrowing the, uh, the 25 square feet that I currently rent. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, it's a little more than that. It's like four hundred square feet. My That's office, right. It, it's yeah. it's it's small. It's cozy, but uh, there's a, a large office behind you, and, and some of that uh, may actually become a little bit of Catholic Underground's uh, stomping area. That's right, Catholic Underground is going to have a remote studio uh, in that area. We'll be able to set up some video cameras and whatnot, and also a little conference area and things of that sort. So that'll be really good for this coming year. Yeah, stay tuned. We might actually give you a video tour of that uh, on CatholicUnderground.tv. Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, that's exciting. And, of course, I'm excited about 2012 as well. There's something about coming into a new year. And, of course, I'm just coming back from vacation, so that has a little bit to do with it, too. I'm unusually chipper, uh, but but I'm very optimistic for the year as well. Uh, it's almost as if um, the Lord is saying, yeah, don't worry, we got it covered. And uh, and so, you know, one of the ways that we know 2012 is going to be great is because we can we have to get to at least 2015 because that's where Marty McFly <laughs> found himself. So That's right. You know, so we're at least we're at least insured through the Back to the yeah, Future we're program. A hoverboard. Yeah, I want the hoverboard. I do. I, I'm sure I would be just as good on it as I would be on an actual state skateboard. But <laughs> not to get us too off the offside, but there actually was. I, I was watching a video. Some uh, Korean scientists have developed anti gravity technology. There it's you go. Working anti gravity and gravity technology. So we're we're only four years or three years away from the hoverboard. Folks. I believe I'd like to see Joshua. <laughs> using that anti-gravity technology i'd love one so so instead of walking you just kind of float by well i make it a habit not to walk ever so <laughs> that's right so that's why he's always in a rolly chair i want that yeah. chair from Wally. yeah there you go that rolling chair that the awesome. cat or the uh that floating that's exactly chair. what i was thinking i was yeah, trying to yeah, figure the, the show out my head was awesome i love one <laughs> you know one of uh, a, a number of saints have floated and i don't know that this one has but uh Blessed Kateri Tekakwitha will be named the saint of the church. That's how you know we're getting off to a good start. One of the Holy Father's uh, last things to do before the year clicked over was to say, yep, she's in. And so uh, and so we're very excited about that. I know um, Father Ryan, actually, uh, not Father Ryan, Father Mark, our uh, our official roadie, uh, has a devotion to Blessed Kateri Tekakwitha. She, of course, would be the first Native American saint, I believe. Is that correct? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Kateri was uh, was a Mohawk and uh, was converted by one of the uh, the early Jesuit martyrs, 
I don't know if she was converted by the martyr or not, but she was converted by one of the early Jesuit missionaries and um, suffered greatly trying to convert other members of her family. Mm -hmm. uh, but a true witness, you know, a true witness of, of not just Peter, but she, there was a certain mysticism associated with her too because she yeah. was given a certain mystical gifts by the Lord in an effort to convert uh, some of her tribesmen. And that's really cool. Uh, and, of course, she, she suffered through a great deal of her life. And um, and I believe was it uh, I can't remember what she had contracted, was it smallpox perhaps or something like that, and it, it yeah it had marred her face and uh, the legend goes that uh, that once she died, um, these physical these you know physical deformations that were as a result of uh, of her illness actually dissolved away and she became as beautiful. Uh, as her soul, and that's uh, that's an awesome thing. So, um, we have a link, of course, in the show notes uh, to uh, just really to the announcement um, from the Vatican Information Service of all the blessed that are going to become saints, etc. And so, uh, Kateri, welcome, welcome. I don't know who we are welcoming you because you actually should be welcoming us. We're hoping. Pray for us. That's right. Pray for, Pray us, for uh, us, blessed right. Kateri, um, who will soon be Saint Kateri Tekakwitha, and uh, we're very excited, very very excited indeed. Now. Okay, we move from from the saintly to uh, to us here on Earth trying to, to get into the future, and the notion that um, that there should be a strategy for a, a digital strategy for American Catholic dioceses because you know everybody is kind of developing their digital thing nowadays. You know, how are they going to find their niche? In fact, a lot of what we talk about on the podcast is very much that: how do we find uh, our role to play in the digital continent? And uh, I don't often link to to the Huffington Post. Um, but, but, uh, I know, but it was a really good article, uh, about, um, about how to develop a digital strategy and how important it is. Uh, one of the things that the article says is Catholics under 30 who embody the future of the church are true digital natives. And that's very true. I mean, you, you look at a, a child who's uh, practically fresh from the womb and they already know how to use an iPad, you know, they experience yeah. life in both the physical and digital space with real-world experiences like the mass amplified across online profiles and communities, sparking curiosity and conversation among people who expect to be able to find answers or at least orthodox clarity of information. This is from a Huffington Post article. Uh, as simply as they search for an address or pay a bill, the digital life, in other words, impacts lines of thinking and personal formation. This leads to the inescapable conclusion the Catholic Church is missing a tremendous opportunity. Is it? Is it? We're here, well, you know. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's that's the thing is the debate has always been whether, you know, Catholics should have a presence in in the digital world. And I, I, I've I've had always had this saying when someone asks me, should Catholics be on Facebook and Twitter and all of these places? And my comment has always been that anywhere that one finds evil, one should also be able to find good. Yeah. That's a, and so yeah. if you're finding the if if you're finding evil places online then Catholics should be there online mm -hmm. as well to, to, to help to combat. That's right. Um, and I think we have an obligation. I mean, I think Pope Benedict has made that very clear in his letters, uh, specifically his letter, 44th World Communication Day, where he talks about in that letter that Catholics have an obligation, not just Catholics, yeah. but priests uh, have an obligation to be present in the digital arena. Yeah, and of course that's one of the reasons that, that we're here, that uh, Catholic Underground exists and that uh, we constantly comment on these things because, you know, that's, uh, that's part of it. And connected to that is uh, the notion that social media may be killing Catholic media. Uh, this comes from, from our good old partner site, CatholicLane.com, mm -hmm. and uh, Mary Kohan, who, who talks about two very serious questions. And I can't wait to hear Father Ryan uh, get, on, get on knees. You just can't wait. Can't. <laughs> she, uh, what? The, the questions are these. How can Catholic media support itself? And does digital ADD make us less human? Right. What, what Mayor is trying to say is she says that, look, you get on social media and what are you confronted with? Well, besides the 600 pictures and the mm -hmm. awesome videos of cats and piano, uh, you also are confronted with literally hundreds of links. And, and, you know, frankly, it's nothing for me to sit down for an hour and see a thousand separate hyperlinks appear right. on the screen. Mm -hmm. And Catholic new media makes that, you know, it's just abundant. You know, you follow a couple couple dozen people on Twitter and there are just links all day long. Right. And so what that does is it makes it very difficult mm -hmm. to really get deep and dig into anything. You know, Thomas right. Aquinas mm -hmm. is not read by by tweets. Thomas Aquinas <laughs> is read by heavy duty thinking. 
Yeah. Uh, and she says that's a big part of the problem. But she also says, you know, there's so much Catholic information out there. There's so much data, you know, and, and uh, there's so many good insights. And in fact, anytime somebody writes a book, it's immediately blogged about. Yeah. She's asking the same question that everybody else in the publishing world is asking. Well, how can I afford to spend a year of my life or longer mm -hmm. preparing some kind of product? That is as good and as worthy and that should be out there, but that is going to be – that all the best parts are going to be immediately popped onto 15 different blogs. Right. And all of my core insights are immediately going to be shared, and yeah. then nobody has incentive to buy my book or subscribe to, to my newsletter or whatever. And so how does a Catholic actually feed a family right. doing this kind of work? It's, it's one thing if you just do it in your spare time, if you have a blog after work, mm -hmm. but – can you make a living being a Catholic evangelist when the web is stealing all your stuff? What do you think, Joshua? You've written for Catholic media, and uh, you've tried to do cyber Catholics uh, professionally. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible? You know, I think I think it's it is possible. It's the opportunities seem to be very few and far between, though. Mm -hmm. um, an individual, I mean, for example, you look at someone like the likes of Dr. Scott Hahn. And uh, any of those individuals who make their living as a Catholic evangelist, um, it's difficult to do so because, number one, you have to have the name recognition. But one of the things that Mary points out is that Catholics don't support their own media. Um, we, yeah. don't, we don't support the people who are producing the materials. And so in turn, uh, you know, if you're not, you know, when it comes down to it, if you're not selling items, if you're not selling CDs, you're not selling DVDs, you're not doing all those things, which can seem very commercial to some yeah. people. Yeah. You know, that's, that's part of the biggest problem, too, is that Catholics have this idea that, that everything should be free. Yeah. And that's the hardest thing. I mean, being as an individual who works for Catholics on a, a full-time basis, mm -hmm. um, you know, whenever you're approached by not, – I'm not going to say the church, but Catholic nonprofits, it's yeah. always – it's always, well, can you do this for us for free? And you want to say, if I do everything for free for everybody, then I, can't, I can do nothing free for – I can't do anything free for anybody at all. That's exactly right, yeah. And, because and the, the point is I try and make is as a, as a businessman, the only way I can give back to, uh, to the church or those places if I'm making something to begin with. Well, if your business is primarily aimed at Catholics right. who believe that everything should be free – and they shouldn't have you that if they pay you for your for what you're doing, then then it's that somehow it's not being you're not evangelizing. You're doing this for the money. Right. Um, then then how are you able to give back at all? Mm -hmm. And you, I think that's the big problem. Yeah. I mean, the laborer is worth his wage, exactly. even if he's Catholic is what you're saying. Well, exactly. And I, I, that's that's the, that's the big problem is that as Catholics, how many how often do I see people go, oh, well, you know what? I, Father, so and so. And, and sister so-and-so made this CD of the rosary. Mm -hmm. Would you like me to burn you a copy of it? Right. Well, like, come on. I mean, you know, we, we think that because it's a matter of, of, of spirituality, then that makes it okay yeah. to infringe on somebody's work, not realizing that, you know what, so, you know, father so-and-so, whatever, they're, guess what? If they're running an apostolate, mm -hmm. that apostolate, how do you think they make those CDs? How do you think they get those things out if they're not, if we're not supporting our own Catholic media and, and it's not pirating, right? Well, how does stuff. how does that reconcile with uh, with what the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops is doing with um, with our old chestnut, the whole copyright thing? Because you know, at some level, it's important that that the 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 people who are digitizing the Bible or putting up the uh, the podcasts or things like that, they they yeah. do deserve their wage, but. You know, where does where does that where does the line get drawn there? Well, too? I mean, the, the 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 real line that that has to be drawn is if something is intellectual copyright of an individual, mm -hmm. whereas if something is intellectual copyright of say, oh God, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> right. you know, yeah. the the USCCB did not invent the Bible. They did not create the Bible. They any of these things. Uh, certainly, we recognize that. You know, um, I think they're uh, again. I think we can all agree that copyright is probably too restrictive. <laughs> a little bit, yes. Uh, yeah, a little bit. A um, a you know, to well, the and, point and that, that part of the question there, Josh. I don't want to cut you off, but sure, no. 
I've got it's, it's kind of choppy, so I don't know when you stop and when you go. Um, one of the big problems there is is that we have to draw the line where the question is the simony, or the sin of simony. Where yeah. are we selling the mystery of faith? You know, yeah, nobody right. needs Dr. Scott Hahn's books to go to heaven. Um, right. There's not any anything in those books that if you don't have, you can't, you know, live a full Christian life. The 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 things that are being copyrighted, like the Mass itself, the text of the Mass, the lectionary, the text of the Bible. Yeah. Yes, the Catholic bishop spent some money, um, you know, paying to have that translation made. And yes, it's unfair for me then to print all of that material and then sell copies of that Bible. Um, you know, and, and and that would be a question uh, that that we may have to ask is, does the U.S. bishop, do the U.S. bishops, should they be the only one who are allowed to print the official Bible of the American church? Right. Mm-hmm. But but I think the question is that line of simony. You know, it's one thing to sell the mysteries of faith and restrict the usage of the mysteries of faith, and it's entirely another to comment on or to make that, uh, to preach about, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think another part of that equation that, that, is, that Josh hit on was, there are ways to sell things that the, the internet is just not good at. You go to a conference, you get a fee, uh, you know, you make a set of, set of DVDs, you make a really good workbook, or you, you produce some kind of room good Bible study, and a handful of people are going to steal that, but most people are going to want the resource book. Most people yeah. are yeah. not going to want to go to the trouble of printing this with Lulu, and, you know, and, um, and so if you create compelling products, then your intellectual ideas can be given away freely, but without that name recognition and without the resources to produce those things, mm-hmm. nobody's going to hear that Father Ryan Humphreys made a good Bible study, and therefore we ought to spend seventy-five dollars to get the parish package of it. Right. Um, you know, and so there's it's it's a very difficult question, and frankly, I don't think there's a right answer right now about mm-hmm. you know should you give stuff away, how do you give stuff away, and can you transition from having a day job doing a podcast at night to doing Catholic media full time and expect to raise a family. Right. Uh, you know, I don't yeah. th- I don't think there is a real answer to that right now because the question is still being understood in the market itself. So you know Josh, right. you may have a well, different perspective. Well you know I would say this. I think it all depends again on the individual. I mean, you know, you could you could very well ask the same question looking outside of the Catholic realm. You could ask the very same question well, you know, how do I become a full-time animator and that's all I want to do is create comics? Right, well, like, yeah. Like Penny Arcade, for example, mm-hmm. which I'm not going to endorse because sometimes their stuff is crude. Yeah. But you look at things like that. You look at, um, you know, um, Homestar Runner. Yeah. Uh, things like that that are in media where these, these are individuals who their full-time jobs or they sit at home in front of their computers, their Macs, or whatever they're doing, and they create these animations yeah. or comic strips, and they make enough money to do that. Now, the individuals who can do that are few and far between. Right. Because how, how are they able to do it? They're really good at it. Yeah. Uh, were they able to start day one and go, oh, I can do this full time? And no. I mean, uh, this no, is something yeah. they, they obviously worked out over time. I mean, just as an individual, myself in business, you know, I remember – uh, whenever I started my business and going, uh, how, how is it possible for me to be able to do this full time? I have no client base. I don't have anything. Right. You just uh, start. You just start and you do it. And then if you're good at it, you succeed and you get to a point where you realize that you can do this full time and you're doing it. Yeah. And you look at, indiv- I look at individuals, for example, like, uh, like Mark Shea and, uh, you know, I know, I know f- f- looking at Mark's 10 cup rattle, he struggles as well. Sure. Uh, and but you have individuals like that who, if you're really good at what you do, uh, then you can succeed. But to, to to jump back again on Father Ryan's point of view, uh, there's you know there's a distinction in again the the materials of Mark Shea mm-hmm. versus the materials of the USCCB. Right. Uh, right. You know what? If someone takes the Bible and quotes it or posts it, um, guess what? The USCCB's livelihood is not based upon the materials they produced. Right. That's not their if you read in fact they say that the reason we have copyrights of the Bible is to protect the protect the Bible from being used wrongly whatever that is. They're but, a little late. But <laughs> Just, well the <laughs> the problem is that is if you release a podcast and you're quoting the Bible they send you a cease and desist letter. Right. And I don't see how that's protecting sacred scripture at all. Yeah. But the other the bigger question is if you know someone like myself produces a DVD 
of a talk that I've given. Well, guess what? That's material that I've produced on my own. Yeah. Again, not coming from the deposit of faith. Right. Certainly not given to us by our Lord himself. Uh, but that's material that has come from my own production against Father Ryan noted. Not necessary for salvation, but... But helpful uh, for it. But helpful. Yeah. And if you want my materials, then rightly so, that you should sure. should pay for those for mm-hmm. those things. Just as, um, you know, if you go into a, a, a to Walmart or another store and you want someone's CD, then you should buy the CD and not shoplift it. Sure. Well, and and in the in the chat room, uh, Coco D, uh, in the chat room it mentions about Catholic school teachers having a very real problem. And we had some some people at Catholicon last year. You know who are really struggling trying to be Catholic school teachers and needing to to be able to make thirty five and forty copies of you know one page or one chapter of a book you know and that does raise a very real question well should I have to buy thirty copies of the book or if I'm just trying to make this available to some young people you know is it okay for me to borrow the ideas is it okay for me to duplicate this um, you know is there really a difference between teaching it at the front from a projector or or duplicating it and handing it out to students. And that's another one of those questions I just don't think we have a clear answer to yet. No. Right. You know, obviously if the Pope has written this, you know, the, it's, it's a book written by a Pope or even, even by a cleric who, whose livelihood is not dependent upon sales of that book, you know, I think that, that changes the moral question some than if it's, you know, Joshua Blanc's brilliant new tome on Mariology and, you know, and he's trying to, to, to support himself and his wife. You know, that, that raises entirely different questions. Um, yeah. but, but it is a question, I think, that, that we need the church to keep talking about, even if we don't have a clear answer to it. There's sure. something that just need to be at the front of our mind mm-hmm. so that we can continue kind of pondering them until they start to come clear. Yeah. And, yeah. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, I, I, think, I think the one thing I want to mention specifically in that realm is because I work with Catholic schools is, yeah, I understand where, where, where Coco D is coming from in that that comment it's you know you, you're on a budget um you know i know a little, specifically one catholic school that i that i worked with as of recently uh they're very careful about copyrights and things like that and i recently saw that they're, they're handing out copies photocopies of a book and i said uh i said what's what's the what's with the story with the photocopies of the book and he says to me i have no other choice i said the book is out of print you can't buy it anymore the publisher doesn't have it i've got one copy all i could do is so he said they actually called the publisher and mm-hmm. said, can I have permission to copy this book? And they said, yeah, go for it. Yeah, and that's <laughs> a lot of the stuff that we have uh, that we would read in the seminary was well out of print, and, and they would do that. But I can see where you'd be, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and a lot of times, a lot of these publishers will work with you. Yeah, sure, especially if it's out of print. Yeah, yeah I mean, I specifically remember one time Ignatius Press, uh, they were out of workbooks, for one of my classes, and I called them and said, look, uh, you're out of workbooks. I can't order anymore. I need to do this. They're like, yeah, just make copies. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice of them, yeah. So uh, it's definitely something that, that needs to continue to be brought to the fore, and uh, we will have the opportunity for uh, for that uh, and something that we're going to talk a little bit about a little bit later in the podcast. Uh, Rick G. also says, I don't see the difference between social media killing Catholic media and social media killing any other media. And, of course, that's that's what it is. It's, it's these little blurbs. That uh, that leads uh, to to the second question, which we might treat really quickly, is is this kind of ADD thing that's beginning to form in our brains uh, really healthy for us? You know, I mean, as you say, Father, um, you get just the the fifteen or sixteen bullet points of a of a deep argument. Uh, can you really digest theology that way? And and does it affect our humanity to be able to do that? Well, remember, all theology begins on your knees, mm. um, and and you can't pretend that by reading 15, 20, 775 blog posts on any topic that somehow now you're really prepared to have a, an opinion that's in any way meaningful. Um, it, it, it's something that we, we really have to recover, the sense that, that I'm not an expert on much of anything, and Father Chris, neither are you, and Josh, neither are you, and it doesn't matter that we've read seven books or even ten books on a topic. Uh, that doesn't yeah. make us experts. And yet a lot of people will get blogs nowadays on social media and comment as if somehow or another they have a doctorate, you know, in, in psychology or sociology or anything else. Um, and I, one of the great problems I have is that you try to get into a discussion with someone, even an intellect, even someone intelligent. I got into a discussion today about pacifism, 
and made a series of, of very direct, simple, logical arguments by, about why pacifism is actually an anti-Christian idea. Well, this person had a freak out. And this is a person with a doctorate, very intelligent, mm-hmm. and just freaking out. And, uh, yeah, I think this, this has created an, an inability to cognate, an inability to really stop and consider something yeah. deeper than the bullet point, deeper than the headline. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it's something that we Catholics really, really uh, need in our own lives to pay very special attention to because it's, it's not okay to just read a bunch of headlines and think that you have the answer right. or you have the... It would be the same thing as just reading the, uh, the, the headline of uh, what's going to be the top of the story in the Bible, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> visits the woman at Samaria. Okay, next one, you know, and you never get into the depth of why he did it, what was taking place there. That's and, right. and we can do the same thing um, if we're not careful. And, and it really does affect our prayer life. So uh, we'll exactly. continue the discussion. And uh, we hope that you'll do the same thing. Backchat at CatholicUnderground.com is the way you can uh, chime in on that. And now we, we move we move from that to something that's uh, part serious and part light. And it just so happens that I, I actually can show you my uh, dental floss here. <laughs> it's going to just kind of, I can't open it though. I was, I was actually going to floss my teeth as a, uh, you know. Um, so, uh the Kurt Jester, who is an inimitable uh, blogger that, that we hope will join us at this year's Catholicon, um, he actually talked about the students at Boston College who are making a stand against um, the Students for Sexual Health, Boston College Students for Secu- Sexual Health, and they pass, pass out condoms on campus. And so, uh, Joshua, tell us a little bit, if you will, or, or Father Ryan, about the Boston College Students for Dental Health. Isn't that great? And I'll just floss. Well, the, the, the Boston College students for dental health stand around and they say, uh, we'll trade you this dental floss for those condoms they just gave you. And, uh, so it's and like an it amnesty a, program thing. Yeah, it, it, it's nothing <laughs> to do with dental floss. None of them are dental students. None of them care about dental health. Uh, <laughs> no. Well, some of them probably do. But they, they're really interested in, in creating a conversation. They want to start a conversation and say, look, don't just take the condom and think that's the answer to all problems. Right. And uh, it created a lot of funny, uh, fun because the, the students for sex health are angry. I mean, they're screaming and yelling and trying to get them kicked off of campus. Over dental things. floss. <laughs> Over dental floss. <laughs> and the students for dental health are just standing there going, I don't understand what makes you so angry. That's right. And uh, it, it really is quite funny. And at the same time, it's that kind of witty humor that really does create conversations worth getting into. And, Everybody uh, has and of course, stick. this is something that, that, that Mr. Miller over at the Kurt Gesture is, I'm sure, just laughing up and down That's about. Right. What did you say there, Josh? Everybody said, Everybody's got a shtick. Everybody's got a shtick. That's right. <laughs> this, is, I mean, this is a great shtick. I love the idea that it's just, it's, it's completely out of left field. It's totally non sequitur. And it's just, yeah, here. Yeah, and it also offered, offered me an opportunity to floss my teeth on the air, which that I think is was great. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Everybody needs more floss. Hey, hey, I got a whole roll here. There you go. Um, yeah. So, so uh, you can read about that. We'll put it on the uh, on the, the website there uh, so you can do that. I just want to pause for a moment and show you Father Humphrey's frozen face. Really is tragic. <laughs> if you're watching us in the video uh, chat, you can see it. If you're not watching us, you're listening to the audio feed. Well, now you've got to go download the, uh, the episode just so you can see the sustained 25 seconds of Father Ryan <laughs> looking as if he's going to kill somebody. <laughs> <laughs> or if he's had just a bit of flatulence after dinner. We had, we had really a tell. freeze before the show, and I looked pleasant. And now, and we said, we'll try to record, the, restore the video. And now, I don't really know what I look like, but I look like <laughs> the godfather taking somebody and going, this isn't going to be good for you, is it? You That's know? right. It's not. <laughs> I'm gonna have to cut you. Gosh! So you're gonna have to be like one of those people who uh, who dances in uh, in Swan Lake or whatever. You just have to keep a smile on your face the whole time. I, I can try, but I'm really not that interesting or that pleasant to be around, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, that's beautiful. All right, <laughs> even when you're out of Bloody Mary mix. Okay, so um, the the great discussion, of course, uh, talking about uh, what it is to be alive, to be, to, to be and to be Catholic, and uh, Dr. Henry Russell's talking about the role of cinema in that and whether or not it's important. And, of course, I think that it is. Um, but he talks about uh, film as being uh, a visual and audio medium, but it can't handle the complexity of philosophical ideas that words allow. And so really it's, it's about um, almost what we were talking about a little bit earlier. Uh, can film actually give us a, a deepening of a philosophical or theological construct over a book, 
Or is a book always better at doing that? That's well, hmm? well, remember the great discussion is this kind of broad topic that's been it's been around for I guess about two hundred years. But the notion is, you know, there that all artists, no matter what their craft, whether they are uh, visual artists, whether they are poets, whether they are authors, mm-hmm. all artists are basically entering into this great discussion about the nature of the universe. Right. What is reality? What does it mean to exist? What is life? What, you know, what is the, the answer to life the universe, and everything? 42. And of course, we know that there's 42. But, uh, but then what are six times seven? And um, film has place in that, that great discussion, but we can't believe it is somehow the best or the only yeah. For nowadays, because there there are really spectacular films, films that that make you go, wow! I I am so thankful that I can like Braveheart is one for me that I can watch that over and over again, and say this since this really teaches me something and allows me to think, it, it raises me to a different type of thinking about some of these questions, but it is not the only and it is not the highest, and film ha- has unique difficulty of demanding that directors and producers not just make a film, not just take a script and do something about it, but that they actually stop and understand the ideas that they're treating. A yeah. musician who, who read a song or wrote a song uh, about something very, very happy and then did a very depressing version of that song mm-hmm. would, would event that they're either a hipster or that they've got some, some real failure to understand what the song is about. Yeah. Uh, for me, one of the, the great examples of this in our modern era is the Lord of the Rings movies. Everybody mm-hmm. agrees. They're spectacular movies to watch. Sure. They are really good. But if you've except read the books... It, 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 exactly. If you read the books and you read that Peter Jackson has totally missed what the book is trying to accomplish. It's not just, oh, he left out Tom Bombadil. It's not just, oh, he left out that scene that I liked or he... He made that person look like I, I didn't think they would look. Right. Nor is it just making a film about an epic. Right. It, mm-hmm. It's that the books have a very specific story to tell about good and about evil, about three Christ figures, Gandalf, Aragorn, and Frodo, going to confront evil, about what it means to confront and overcome evil. And what Jackson has done in making a great, great action film is basically remove all the heroism Mm-hmm. from the books. He's made everybody cowardly, and he's made everybody mixed up and reluctant. And that's a failure to understand what the books are about. And so even though he's made a cool movie, he's not made a good movie. And then there are other examples of people who have made spectacular movies. Um, you know, The Brides Had Revisited miniseries is a good example from the BBC of a movie that not just takes the book, but that actually really understands what the author is trying to communicate, and then puts that out on the screen. And so the great discussion, the great conversation, requires that everybody who take part in it Mm -hmm. actually take part in it, and not just make something to make something, or write something to write something, or paint something to paint something. But it should be ordered toward the great discussion, as you say. And that's, I mean, as as someone who draws as an artist, you know, I've kind of uh, reinitiated Joe Catholic, uh, my little uh, ongoing serial, uh, that's part of the, the stuff that I, that's going on in my head is am I just drawing a comic to draw a webcomic and say I've done it or do I really want to engage the universe <laughs> imagine that I'm creating for the universe engage the universe in dialogue about well what is the nature of, of life of discernment of the functioning of the Holy Spirit and uh, I'm trying not to undercut that hopefully I'm not yet but I'm only 10 pages in so <laughs> we'll see yeah uh, but that is, that's, that's very good. Uh, we'll put the links, you can see the link on the screen if you're watching us. Uh, if not, you can go to our show notes at catholicunderground.com uh, to engage, perhaps, in, in the great discussion. Uh, I'm going to go off script for just a minute because there's something that we haven't covered that's really important for us to cover. And, and that actually just happened, what was it, yesterday, the day before yesterday? The first. The first, of, the first of January. And it is an occasion for great news. It is a day of great rejoicing. And that is the personal ordinariate of the chair of St. Peter, um, under the protection of Our Lady of Walsingham, exists. It has come into existence, and, and yep. we are uh, so excited about that. Uh, I know, Joshua, we're, I, I don't know about you, but I'm especially excited because uh, we know where, where the, uh, the house is going to be, <laughs> where, the, where this ordinary is going to be stationed. Yeah, that's, that's right. The, uh, the, the, the new ordinary who was, who was uh, chosen by Pope Benedict XVI um, 
his name is uh, Father Jeffrey Steenson. He is a priest of the, um, I don't know if he's a priest of the, uh, or he was a priest of the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, I think. Um, he was a former Episcopal bishop of the Diocese of the Rio Grande down there. Well, he became Catholic uh, uh, priest. He was named the first ordinariate of the new, uh, the first ordinary of the new ordinariate. And the, the mother seat, you can't call it a cathedral because mm-hmm. uh, it's not really a, a diocese, but their mother seat is going to be Our Lady of Walsingham in Houston, which, of course, is my preferred church whenever I go to Houston. I think Father Chris and I uh, could get there with our eyes. Uh, we could. We know the way. Blindfolded. That's right. <laughs> we're an autopilot whenever we're going to Mass. That's right. Yeah. I, I'm just I'm a, so it's excited. It's a beautiful church and a beautiful community. Yeah. And uh, they really are a beautiful community. In fact, uh, we'll put up on in the show notes uh, the website for the personal ordinary of the chair of St. Peter so that you can read a little bit more about it. Because a lot of folks don't understand and don't realize that this is a really actually a big deal, isn't it, Father Ryan? It, it absolutely is. The uh, the U.S. bishops uh, who, who were in charge of, of making this happen we're estimating that there would be as many as four or five large groups uh, that will be coming into the church. And as of the first, there were more than 300 applications Which is of just entire m- parishes. That's entire insane. Entire parishes that are, that are ready to become full Catholics. Now, their liturgies will be slightly different, um, mm-hmm. but, but it's astounding just how vigorously... Yeah. Uh, the faith is desired by those who do not have access to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a wonderful gift to us, and it's something that I don't think anybody really expected how large it's going to be. And also, we have a bit of an end because Father Steenson went to college with our very own Stanley PXJMQQQRC Corinth. Of course he did. Uh, Pastor of St. Patrick's down on Camp Street in uh, oh. New Orleans, Louisiana, not far from where Catholic 2012 will be located. That's right. And, and, uh, and mm-hmm. make correction, Father Steenson is a priest of the Archdiocese of Santa Fe. Okay. So, But not anymore, of course. He's a... Right. <laughs> That's right. He's, he's kind of got a new job. Yeah. And, and because I'm an artist, I, I want to take just a second to, or <laughs> I think I am, um, I want to look at the coat of arms of the ordinary. It's really beautiful. Yeah. Um, it, uh, it, it has uh, the, the keys of Peter and then, of course, the, uh, the scepter. Uh, I, I love how they put it in the Old English. Uh, de bruised by a scepter flory of the third and pale, sprouting three fleur de lis, petaled argent and stend of the third. Uh, meaning it's, it's basically a, a scepter with three fleur de lis stemming from it, um, which mm-hmm. is beautiful because it's the lily held by Our Lady of Walsingham. Uh, and, of course, it's, it's crossed with the keys of St. Peter. That is really, really cool. It, uh, it ignites all of, uh, all of my passionate artistic tendencies I, uh, I for think, ecclesiastical I, I, art. I think the blue and red is just too bright for me. It's a little, it's a little bright. Um, yeah, uh, I'm not really. Did they say what the colors are for, though? I don't think so. They don't say what the colors are for. Blue and red. I'm sure the blue is probably for Our Lady and probably blue, red for the blood of the martyrs. Yeah, something. something like that. It, it may actually be for the Church of England. Oh, maybe. Possibly. As a, as they don't a, say. Yeah, they don't say, but I mean, but blue and red are, are for traditional colors associated with the crown. Yeah. That's true. They, yeah, they, those regal colors. Christ the King, perhaps, and Our, and our Lady, that sort of thing. Yeah, you never know. Unless they we'll, put it in the we'll list. We'll figure it out later. No problem. Sorry, <laughs> right, we'll fix it in post. So... <laughs> That's the way it goes, yeah. Now, uh, now I'm gonna uh, go back on on script, I guess. Uh, let's see what we got. I'm just kind of looking at the time here because you know we are a podcast. We could go all night, but uh, well, you know, we're, we're not going to. Um, no, we won't. But we won't uh, for for your own good. Uh, Jennifer Fullweiler has a great article on stewardship, and oftentimes when we think of stewardship, we think of saying yes. You know, like whenever we think about donating to the Catholic Underground, we want you to say. Yeah, I think so. Like but the Tonight Show? Like, yes. That's right. You are correct. Uh, ah. <laughs> but Jennifer's point is that saying no is an essential point, uh, part of stewardship. And, oh. uh, and that's, that's a really uh, clever uh, thing to think about, that you can only be a good steward of your present responsibilities by limiting other ones. And, of course, this is a pot kettle issue for Father <laughs> Ryan, Joshua, and myself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, but actually, we... Um, we, we really do uh, make a good stewardship uh, offering whenever we say, no, I, I can't do that because I am actually uh, engaged in this. I think from, from a different perspective, from the, the perspective of a pastor mm-hmm. who has, you know, every, every parish that I've ever been to has about 15 to 20 percent, uh, and, and usually less than that, probably closer to 6 or 7 percent, 
that are doing everything. They're the ones who are the sacristans. Sure. They're the yeah. ones who cook the suppers. They're the ones who do everything. And those people are often the victim of yeah. being asked to do everything. Sure. You know, you need to... Because you know they'll do yard, it. You need Ooh. the yard mulched. Go call so-and-so. <laughs> uh, but yeah. a good pastor who understands stewardship and uh, a good volunteer both have to be willing to say, no, you can't do this because you're already overworked. Mm -hmm. Or, no, I'm sorry, we can't do your product or we can't do your event or we can't do your project or anything else that you want because we just can't overwork our people. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just an essential part of being a pastor, but we have to remember it's also an essential part of charity and justice, yeah. saying that mm -hmm. we're going to do what we can do and do it well and right. not try to do everything and then do it with great mediocrity. Yeah. And that's really what this is about. This is this is not about um, you know just saying no so that you can be lazy, but it's actually saying no so you can achieve excellence and virtue. Mm -hmm. And and we oftentimes I think we we think um, because we're human beings and we live in a world of commodity, we tend to think of things in terms of supply and demand. You know, well there is a demand, uh, there's no supply, and if not me, who? And that's true to a degree, but, uh, you know, we all as human beings are, are expendable in some way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's hard for us to, uh, to, to understand or agree to. And it, it, it's also hard because we have a sense that we want to do what God wants us to do. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's fairly easy to feel bad if you have an hour or two in your day and you're not doing anything. Yeah. And part of that is, is the danger of, not being able to stop and pray, mm -hmm. not being able to stop and wait. Yeah. And if you find yourself in an hour and you're saying, I've got to do something, then you have a problem. Yeah. You need to train yourself to say, I've got an hour. I can go say a prayer yeah. or I can simply sit here and I can just enjoy the experience of being near to God. Prayer is raising the heart and mind to God. It doesn't have to be a rosary or Lexio Divina. Right. And, uh, you know, that that's something that a lot of, of past uh, forget to tell their people of the need mm -hmm. to stop and and meditate, just be with the Lord, just mm -hmm. kind of breathe and exist because there's a need for that in our world. Yeah, um, uh, I, I'm reminded of uh, a series of talks that I gave uh, and prepared for um, for our Vesper service for this Advent uh, in, in my parishes. And it was by, it's a tremendous little book. We will put a link in the show notes. Uh, Archbishop uh, Anthony Bloom, who was the Russian Orthodox Archbishop of Great Britain, wrote a great little book called Beginning to Pray. And that was exactly what he was talking about throughout, uh, throughout the book, is first of all, the importance of realizing that we have a need to pray, that we have a need to knock on the door, and this is something that must continuously be done. And then if the Lord does indeed grant us access throughout that continual knocking, we have to be able to be with him. And then once we are with him, our activity will be defined. You know, the, the activities that we will, we will return to will be ennobled and, uh, and, and sanctified by our time spent with him. But we have to be willing to say, you know, I, I'm going to waste time. And people get mad at me when I say this, but that's Archbishop Bloom's words. I need to be able to waste time with God. Yeah. You know, and, and make meaningful prayer. And then from there, my stewardship will become clear. You know, because that's what being a steward is all about, not just simply mopping up what needs to be mopped up every time, but uh, but being a, a, a studious mopper, I guess. I <laughs> a moppet. <laughs> By being a moppet. A muppet. Anyway, uh, so uh, moving on from that, uh, we've got the Archbishop of Dublin, speaking of uh, people doing and not doing. Uh, the Archbishop of Irish boys? The Archbishop of Dublin says that faith is weak in Ireland and the fault lies with the church. And, uh, and so that's, it, it's really an indictment, isn't it, Father? Because we've been trying to get to the bottom for years now of, uh, of what's going on really with the church in Ireland, who is one of the eldest churches, huh? one of the eldest communities uh, within uh, the church that's called Catholic. Right. Uh, he's basically saying the same thing that, that a lot of people say, which is, if you're not practicing Catholic, or you don't believe what the church believes, then just stand up and say it. Yeah. You yeah. know, I mean, don't don't pretend that you're Go Catholic. Home. You know, I mean, <laughs> if, right. if if if, some, if there are a lot of American politicians who don't believe what the church says, and it would be so much better for everyone involved, they would just say, "I was Catholic at one point, but I no longer believe." Right. You know, there there are plenty of people, probably a, a frighteningly large number in our churches, mm -hmm. that don't believe that come to mass once a month or less, or only Christmas and Easter Catholics or C and E Catholics. Yeah. Um. They don't believe. 
what the church believes. They don't practice the Catholic faith, mm-hmm. but they have this kind of vague sense of trying to fulfill whatever guilt is in them. And, you know, sometimes you just want to have the guts to stand up and say, I don't believe. And, and if you don't believe, then just say it. I am not a member of the Pentecostal church. I mm-hmm. don't believe what they believe. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing frightening to me about saying that. Right. And, you know, so, and, and, and his concern is if you don't believe, then just by God stand up and say, I don't believe and I'm not going to come to church. Anymore. Right. So be honest about your relationship to the church. Yeah. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, we, we know in Ireland, and I, I fear the same thing will happen in the United States, you know, if we're not careful, is that you could have mass attendance at like at 20 percent. And then of that 20 percent, maybe 10 percent <laughs> believe what the church teaches and want to try to practice it. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think the other part of that equation is. There are a lot of priests, and I've, I've fallen into this before, too, where you look out at a congregation and you say, God, I can't preach that mm-hmm. because these people are not going to respond well to it, or mm-hmm. I can't preach a sermon about abortion or contraception or homosexuality because, wow, that's, those people right. just aren't going to believe that. Yeah. And, and the sad fact is there's a lot of them that aren't, but if they're the ones that don't believe, well, you, know, right. you can't base your entire ministry on trying to appease and comfort those who don't yeah. believe. And yeah. that's another one of the things he says. He, he says you, you need to strengthen what remains. We right. need to, to hold fast to what makes us Catholics mm-hmm. and not continue the delusion that we can basically be what Lutherans, yeah. you know, I'll and tell you, like Wolfgang and, and think it's going to be okay. I'll, I'll tell you a case in point, and, and uh, this is something that happened at Christmas Eve Mass, and it really struck me to the core. In fact, uh, I'm dealing with the fallout now. Uh, because I live in, in a small town, or, or I'm a priest in two small parishes in, in, in kind of in the country. And that was uh, at, at uh, midnight mass. No, it wasn't midnight mass. It was the vigil of Christmas. So it was the 5 p.m. mass. Um, I noticed uh, several people in the congregation chewing gum. So, you know, I look out, and as I'm giving uh, the homily and everything, I, I, just, I can see the, the chewing, you know. Um, and it wasn't lozenge chewing, you know, I can, I can understand, you know, if you, if you're trying to, to not cough or something like that and you have a lozenge in your mouth, you know, the, the church does allow in the taking of medicine for yep. the communion fast to be commuted and, and perfectly fine. But this was, this was obviously gum, you know? And so I was trying to figure out in my head as I'm preaching the homily, okay, now how am I going to address this? Because it, it wasn't just a few people, you know? There was somebody in, in the, near the front row that was chewing. There were all these folks that were kind of in the back. And so I said, well, here's what I'll do. Um, I'll kind of, uh, kind of twist a little bit. And before I begin the, the preface, um, so, so uh, right before the, um, the, the Lord be with you and with your spirit of the, of the preface, right? Um, mm-hmm. I, I said kindly, I said, if there are any in the congregation that are chewing gum out of respect for our newborn Lord, who is preparing to be to make himself present in, in the Eucharistic sacrifice, I would ask that you please remove any gum from your mouth. Please uh, disco- dispose of it uh, in some way so that, that um, you know, we can give due, due honor to, to our Lord. It was very polite, and, and so um, I, I began the preface. And uh, as I begin the preface, there's, there's uh, one person who is in the third row who is continuously chewing. And so uh, I, I kind of kept my eye throughout the, the preface, kind of kept my eye on the situation. And uh, as the Sanctus began, um, I said, well, I need to do something about this, you know, because it was, it was obvious. And, and because I'd asked nicely, I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, is there defiance going on here, you know? Uh, so I went down to, to this person during the Sanctus, and, and I said, uh, um, you, you need to... to take the gum out of your mouth and the person said well i'll 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 do that later and i said no and so i I held my hand out and i said no now you know and and the person embarrassed you know took the gum out put it in my hand i went and i put it in the sacristy and then after that uh i went back and and um continued you know uh, the mass and everything well after mass uh, i didn't see this person again but uh, another person came up to me and said that was inappropriate what you did father absolutely inappropriate and I said, well, I asked nicely. This was, you know, the, the Eucharist is the core of what we believe. And I asked nicely. It still continued. So I, I did what any father should do. I went down and I corrected the behavior. And uh, that's not something that's easy to do. But as a priest, it's my job to defend the Eucharist. It's the, the center of what we believe. Mm-hmm. And the person says, no, that's not your job. Your job, and I don't remember what the person said, but it was basically your job's not to... Uh, 
to do that. It's to make people feel welcome. And the person then said, well, this person wasn't Catholic and they might have been thinking about it, but you cinched it for. And I'm thinking to myself, well, first of all, the person that, that was chewing gum received communion. So if they were not Catholic uh, right there, there was a bit of a, a catechesis issue. And, uh, and if they were Catholic, well, then hopefully they will understand what we believe. You know, if, if, if you don't believe in the Eucharist as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who was made present for us and we receive him into our bodies and there are things that we do to prepare for that, well, stand up and say it. But, yeah. but don't make me, the priest, the bad guy, because I'm actually trying to defend the central, the core of our belief, you know? Father, if you don't mind, I'm going to take the soapbox for a minute. Take your soapbox. I'm taking the soapbox because... The very core of this is because, as you said, you took a fatherly role. You look at our society, people do not know what it means to be a parent. Well, and that's the problem. Yeah. They think your job is to be a social worker, not and a friend. To do with a, yeah, right, what a parent does. I'll give you a perfect example. I went out last night for some, uh, like I occasionally do, I went with Annie and myself and some friends and uh, a priest friend of ours, and we went bowling. And while we're there at the bowling alley, on one side of us, there are teenagers bowling. And I, people I would assume were the parents. You couldn't tw- tell because they were dressed like 12-year-olds and acting like 12-year-olds on one side of us. And on the right side of us, behold, the same thing going on. You have 12-year-olds that are bowling with the mom who's dressed like she's a 12-year-old. Um, <laughs> they all had juice boxes, didn't they? It was, it was insanely embarrassing. And, you know, we're, we're making references to the fact that you can clearly tell that this is going on because the moms are running over to the teens with their cell phones like, oh, look at this message I got. You know, just yeah. like, a, you know, a teen would do to another. And because parents have somehow or another think their role is to be their child's best friend in the world – instead of their parent. Yeah. And so they, they want priests or anybody in authority to likewise right. simply don't correct me and do what's good for me. You're supposed to just love me and be sunshine and flowers. You know, and there are appropriate all, time for sunshine and flowers, but the liturgy you know, is not one of them. Well, ex- exactly. That's my, that's my point. You know, if you, what parent would see a child running to a hot stove with a, with a, full of boiling water and say, do whatever you want. It's all good and fine. Just have fun. I'll just send a text saying that you're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what parent would Don't allow that? Do now, that. in our current times, we see all these instances where parents do allow stuff like this and let their kids do whatever they want. And this is in the news and all of these sorts of things. But what do they expect? They, they turn around, they expect our priests to not be fathers. They expect you to just allow whatever they, whatever you know, people want to do it makes them happy. And God forbid you should stand up and, and take a stand on something and say, no, this is not appropriate. Right. You shouldn't be doing this. Uh, but no, you're not supposed to do that. And that's the real problem is that parents don't know how to be parents. Right. And so they don't expect you to be one. And so we, we see, uh, not to get, we have strayed far from the topic, thanks to me, but, but this is what's happening as a culture within the church in Ireland and it's little things like that, that that make me wonder in our own society in the United States, you know, are we willing to stand up for what we believe? And as you say, Father Ryan, if you don't believe it, stand up and say so and try and figure out what it is that you do believe, you know, and if you got if you feel compelled to go do that thing, do it. And this is not relativism. Yeah. This is saying, look, we're, we're talking about not being lukewarm here because, as I recall, something is written about uh, about being lukewarm in Scripture. And it's not exactly, um, you know, good if you're in that position. Well, you know, the, the other thing you have to want, you want to keep in mind, and, and non-priests probably don't think this way, if I go to the front of that church day in and day out, and I'm a priest for 50 years before I drop dead, and I go up to judgment seat, and God looks at me and goes, why did you let those people remain in mediocrity yeah. for your entire yeah, priesthood? Right. I think about you that so much. Yeah, I mean, you stood up there, and boy, you... You were sweet and polite, and those people felt like they were welcome. And they're all burning in hell now, but they felt like they just had a place in that church. And now we're going to send you down to the fire of Gehenna. Won't that be fun? Because you never once said, hey, mediocrity is not enough to go to heaven. Right. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not nice to have to challenge somebody. No. It's not nice. It's not easy either. 
no, no, it's you, very, very difficult. But, you know, but priests have to do it if they care about their own salvation. Exactly. And frankly, it That's doesn't exactly. matter whether people feel comfortable. If they feel comfortable, there's a problem in that church. Yeah. Well, you know, it was Winston Churchill who said that you have enemies good. That means you stood up for something in your right. life. Right. That's right. The man who has no enemies is doing something wrong. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that, right. That's very true. Yeah. So, uh, so yes, uh, all that being said, uh, this dental floss made in Ireland. Ugh. No joke. <laughs> So this plaque, made this, plaque. Pla- this plaque <laughs> made in plaque <laughs> made in my teeth. So, uh, so yeah, let's, let's all stand up for, for what we don't do it now. You don't have to do it now, but, uh, but we do, if I did, Father, <laughs> that's right. We do need to stand up and strengthen what remains. You can tell us, uh, basically what, what you've done. Uh, maybe, maybe some of the issues that you've dealt with are, are real. Let us know back chat at Catholic underground.com. You can also let us know by uh, coming into the live chat at Catholic underground.tv. Uh, while we're on the air every Wednesday um, from, uh, from, from 9, 8 central time. Okay, now, you've been asking about it. We know you have because you've been emailing us about it. But, uh, Joshua, we're pretty excited because a lot of things fell into place today automatically. Lo and behold, <laughs> things just happen like that. I mean, you know, I wake up one morning having not worked on anything for Catholic Underground maybe, you know, in a week or so. And I go, you know, today I'm going to do some stuff. And the Lord just sends a whole bunch of stuff uh, our way. Um, I guess the first thing happened whenever it was with you this morning, huh, Father? Doesn't it always? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you got a phone call. I did. I, I got a phone call. Actually, no, before the phone call, you and I were chatting. I was going to the That's office. That's right. You and I were chatting about, well, you know, I guess we need to do this, that, and the other for Catholicon. <laughs> right. I called you and I said, <laughs> I said, well, you know, I'm ready to... to uh, we have the hotel and everything on the on the on the hook. Uh, I said, but I'm not signing anything until we hear back from the archdiocese. And uh, uh, and, and right after I hung up with Josh, my office line rings and it's the archdiocese. Uh, so <laughs> so we had a, a very good discussion about that. It looks like things are moving forward. And uh, and so indeed, unless something happens between the next uh, week or so, uh, the the event will be Joshua in New Orleans. That is correct. We have confirmation, so you're hearing the details, the juicy details first. Um, the hotel will be the Intercontinental New Orleans, and the weekend is scheduled for September 14th through 15th, 2012. So Catholic on New Orleans, book your calendars because soon those rooms and tickets will be able to you know, be purchased online. Not quite yet. Uh, right now, we're just announcing those dates so you can, you know, save the date in your calendar. Again, That's right. uh, the Intercontinental uh, New Orleans, which is actually, I believe, it's on Canal Street near Poydras. Oh, so near, very near the aquarium. Really, very, very close to downtown New Orleans. Uh, so if you're going to be coming in for Catholicon, you'll be able to experience some of that downtown era uh, area um, and some of New Orleans hospitality this September 14th through 15th. And, and we're very excited about that. You're right. It is a. Uh, it is dangerously close to downtown. Um, in fact, uh, let's see. If far I can... enough. Yeah, it's... Well, you're, you're not far from Jackson Square. You're not far from the cathedral. You're not far from the yeah. Cabildo. There's certainly stuff to see. There's some great food within that range. Sure. And uh, people who are familiar with New Orleans will know it's a great place. And people who are not uh, will very have very very easy access to a lot of really right. great places. See. Yeah. It's on St. Charles. I, I, I don't know why I okay, said Okay, St. Charles. Okay, sure. Yeah, I said Canal, but it's right off of Canal. St. Charles is... Yeah, so you're about, uh, what, well, you're about four blocks from Canal. Um, mm-hmm. There's a Quiznos nearby, which as Father <laughs> Ryan and I know, that's really all that matters. About. Delicious. <laughs> that's right. The chicken carbonara, regular. Yep. Uh, we gained a lot of weight that year in the seminary. Father, we did. <laughs> well, between that, the sushi buffet, the, the Vietnam, well, you never liked the Vietnamese restaurant, but we had, we had like five days a week. We had restaurants we were going to. It <laughs> That's pretty true. bad. It was. It was all my fault, too. With the Sunday morning, the gigantic uh, brunch, it was bad. That's true enough. Time. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so put but, it on your calendar. 14 but not only, not only put it on your calendar, we need your help. We need you to tell your friends, your family, anyone that you may think be interested in Bacatholicon, send them emails. Uh, Even people you don't think are interested. That's right. If you, you know, you're, tell your atheist veterinarian. It doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> tell them to go on over to CatholiconExpo.com. There you can sign up for the mailing list. If you sign up for the mailing list, you will know everything going on. You'll find out about speakers as we have them ready. Right. You'll also find out when we're going to have tickets for sale, when the rooms will be able to be booked. All of those things, CatholiconExpo.com. Again, tell as your famous, you know, 
event Catholic evangelist Jesse Romero says, tell two people, tell That's two right. people. Exactly. Uh, just send out emails. We need you to blast and get the word out about this event uh, so it can be successful for the greater glory of God. That's right. Josh is really excited, but the best thing exactly. to do is catholiconexpo.com and, uh, and sign up for the mailing list. That's way, That way you'll get uh, informations. So very good. All righty. Well, uh, that's going to do it for us uh, this week because, well, we, we have plenty more to get to get through. But, uh, you know, that's the beauty of doing this show is we don't always get through everything. So that means you have to tune in next week, doesn't it? Um, we, we don't want to leave without doing our, our picks of the week because those are nope. very important. Uh, and so uh, what I'm going to do, I have to I have to segue through this because I, I've been a little while. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, y'all. Uh, what, what we got here is uh, our pick of the week. All right, that was the uh, official pick of the week noise. Uh, <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, Joshua, what's your pick of the week? You know, my pick of the week is actually a new item I just received. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, I bought them together on Amazon as a combination. I'm going to see if I can hold them up. It is a keyboard and mouse a combination set. This is the Logitech uh, K750 keyboard. As you can see, one of the cool features about it is at the top, it's got two solar panels. Oh. So this keyboard actually powers itself off of the, cho- uh, off of the solar panels. Uh, it has internally one of those little uh, CR2035 watch batteries that it constantly recharges. Uh, I got this right before Christmas, so it's one of the really cool things. Hold it up is- again there, Josh. I'm going to hold this up again. There you go. Hmm. They make a Mac version as well that comes in silver. So, um, so it again, matches you your see- stuff. That's right. <laughs> it comes in silver. <laughs> It's got the, uh, the, the solar panels on top. Um, one of the nice things that it also has, too, is it has this little, uh, this little button here. I don't know how well you can see it. That if you press it, it shows you the amount of lumens that are coming in. So you can see how well your battery has been char- is, is being charged. And even in very dim light in my office, uh, the battery has never gone below 100%. So the battery stays charged all the time. Um, and so I, it's really good for me because I hate to run out of batteries. I never bought one of these things because I hate running out of batteries mm-hmm. on Bluetooth devices all the time. But then I also bought uh, what they're calling this um, – uh, in fact, I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's, it's potato the salad. Sorry. <laughs> well, it's the M705 mouse uh, from Logitech, which they're calling marathon. the marathon mouse. Uh, well, the reason they call it the marathon mouse is because it just takes two uh, AA batteries – but this, this device is practically guaranteed to last three years wow. of battery power. So there's actually uh, an app for it will tell you how many days it has left. That's awesome. And in fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it up so I can see how many days it says I have left on my mouse. Um, unfortunately, you can't put a solar panel on a mouse. But um, Yet, on, on, on my mouse, it says I have 1,090 days of power remaining. Nice. So... Uh, it should no blow a little to, trumpet whenever it's getting right. Burr, burr. Yeah, no having to worry about, um, you know, devices dying anymore and getting the wires off my desk. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I was re- really excited about is you could, because if you've bought these things before, you know they come with a little, basically a Bluetooth dongle mm-hmm. uh, that, it, that they talk to each other. It's not Bluetooth, but it's, it's similar to it uh, that they, they transmit to each other on. And in the past, you had to have one for each for the mouse and the keyboard. Well, with Logitech's unifying software, you can actually have your mouse and keyboard, keyboard share the same dongle. So now I save a USB port. So I've got just one USB. One just, in fact, here's the, the dongle right here sitting on the side of my monitor, very small. And it powers both my keyboard and my mouse. Love it. I, I'm, I'm tempted to, to, to look into that. The silver one, of course, because I do use a Mac. It's very nice. It does, have, it does have buttons on the top that you can use with the function keys for home, email, search, all of those things. And you can, once you install the software, you can control how they, would they do them on your own. So it's pretty cool. You can program it yourself. So again, that's the, uh, the K750 for the keyboard and the M705 for the mouse by Logitech. For Logitech plus cu dot, cucast.me slash x85c27. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just look in the show notes. Okay, my pick of the week is something that I found very useful because as a, as a quasi-web designer, I am forever forgetting 
the HTML and the hex value and the alt value for the elusive Ray Quo. At least that's what I call it anyway. And so, uh, and so my, my pick of the week actually is something that I stumbled upon, um, a website that reminds you of what these things are. Now, this is extremely geeky, so just beware. Uh, but, uh, but basically, if you, if you need to get the, uh, the Ray Quo, this will tell you what it is in HTML, in URI, which I never use, and in bin. So, so if you need, if you absolutely have to have um, the the Ray Quo, the the LSA Quo, um, or or single quote or double quote, it's all there. It's all there for you. So, if I were to click click the the close quote, tells you what it is in HTML, tells you what it is um, to get it on the Mac. Oh, that's awesome! <laughs> and then it tells you what to get it on on the Windows computer. Um, and we're also uh, serving Ooh. some Google AdWords apparently there. So um, that is my pick of the week. And you know what? While I'm here, I'm going to do another pick of the week, uh, completely un- unrehearsed. But we were talking about, about Catholic art and the great discussion. I stumbled upra- upon a great Catholic comic, a Catholic webcomic uh, called Greetings from the Greetings from Gracieland.com. And, and it is awesome because it is actually a Catholic comic strip. And it's about, uh, about this, this Catholic family. And it's really funny. I haven't read, in fact, I haven't read uh, this week's yet. Uh, let's see. Wait, what did he just say? Sunny and warm, but I'm wearing my jammies inside out. Everybody knows that if you go to sleep wearing your jammies inside out, you get a snow day. It's science. Why would anyone listen to a weatherman who doesn't understand simple science like wearing your jammies inside out? I wonder if Al Roker knows about this. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, so this is a great little webcomic. Uh, it's family friendly. It's Catholic. Uh, the little girl that her, she and her brother go to a Catholic school. Um, there's some really cool uh, comicry on the uh, the new translation of the Roman Missal uh, and things of that nature. And uh, so I'm I'm actually very excited about this little comic strip. Uh, so uh, so make sure you give it a, a shot. Greetings from Gracieland.com. We'll put that in uh, in the show notes. And no, the kid isn't homeschooled, as you can see on the screen. Um, it was all through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Anyway. Um, all right, that's uh, that's a ticket there, Father Ryan. I I could just go on forever. Um, you but, could go on forever. Well, I've got a very simple one, and I won't do much prefacing. Uh, I'm a big fan, obviously, of OCD and obsessive compulsive organizational systems, and <laughs> I'm know. always looking for a new, simple, quality list maker. Um, there's an app, a web app called Workflowy, WorkflowY.com. It is remarkably simple. Uh, that that does exactly what I want it to do. And nothing more. It works on my iPad. It works on my iPhone and any uh, HTML5 device. It is remarkably intuitive. And it uses a cool wiki feature that a lot of people uh, wouldn't think useful until they actually started using it, where uh, when you want to zoom in on like a, a major topic, like uh, the head of a, you know, an item that has several sub-items, it kind of wikis its way in and puts little breadcrumbs at the top. Oh, this is so totally you, you Father. Oh, yes. You can look at however you want. You can, can interact with it in a lot of different ways. It has some very strong exporting features, and uh, I just find it to be a remarkably useful, good uh, kind of site. And, it, and you don't have to put up with the usual nonsense. All the, you know, it's like you have to log in every time. You, it doesn't have good cookie work, um, it, or it's badly implemented, or it's hard to use, or it's just great. It's a really good thing. And so uh, Workflowy, WorkflowY.com, uh, Check it out. It's, it's really, really worth seeing, and I think you'll enjoy it, and it is all kinds of free. Well, we like now, free. Now said that, let me also thank Audible.com for their sponsorship of the Catholic Underground. Audible is the world's leading supplier of audiobooks, spoken word digital audio, and if you were to surf over to audibletrial.com slash catholicunderground, you're going to get two free weeks to try out the gold plan. Now, the gold plan offers you one audiobook every month, and it gives you access to tons of discounted materials. That's books, magazines, daily newspapers like the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times. You can turn your commute or your time at the gym or your yard work to something really and truly meaningful. This week I'd like to recommend, mostly because we talked about him a lot and used as an example, Dr. Scott Hahn's book, Reasons to Believe, How to Understand, Defend, and Explain the Catholic Faith. Uh, it's a great book. I think it's we we recommended Dr. Hahn before. It's an excellent uh, but, book. Yeah, that, I use it as my textbook for uh, teaching Catholic doctrine to adults. What did, mm-hmm. what, I found that his books, he reads a lot of them, and then other people read others. Very readable, and they, yeah. they, it's good to it listen is. to. They're not overly heavy and hard to get get your head around. So, uh, Dr. Scott Hahn, 
reasons to believe, audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. Check them out, and thank you if you've already done so. That's right, and, and some of you have. And, and as always, we're very, very grateful uh, to, to any of the assistance that you provide to us. I mean, uh, for those of you who've donated in the past year, uh, in 2011, we thank you so much. We couldn't have done video this year without, without you. And uh, we're hoping to, to get a little bit better, to, to, to grow a little bit in that this year, um, to, to get ready for Catholicon. And so uh, if, you, if you can donate, if it's worth your while, if what we do is important to you, uh, please let us know by clicking Donate on our website. If you go to CatholicUnderground.com, um, that's uh, the big green button there, Donate, and uh, you, can, you can help us out. Because this isn't our number one job. We don't monetize this readily. In fact, there are plenty of things that we do for free, and quite happily so. Um, not just this podcast, but also uh, Father Ryan's uh, Life is Still Worth Living specials on the Roman Missal that have been getting a lot of good, uh, a lot of good press. Uh, he, that's free. You, you offer that free, don't you, Father? That's free. I do. Yeah, and so, uh, so help us out if you can. We know if you can't, uh, you certainly will pray for us, and that's actually more important because it is, and Josh will tell you this very well, it is your prayers that keep us pumping from one episode to the next. That would be only the only thing doing it. Yeah, exactly, because because uh, it certainly ain't the cash flow, and uh, usually when, as we've said before, when we're about ready to kill it and say, okay, flip the switch, turn it off, we get an email from one of you, or we get a, a Facebook post or a question, and um, and we keep on going. So thank you very much. If you want to get our Twitter feed, our Facebook page, and if you want to see a uh, live video throughout the week, you can go to catholicunderground.com, and that's the place to do it. You can also find all of our audio podcasts as well as Father Ryan's kicking series on the uh, Roman Missal. Um, yeah, do that. CatholicUnderground.com. All righty. Well, well, uh, I'm going to I'm going to spill a little bit because I still have to turn on the uh, the closing theme. <laughs> you know, anyway, one day I'll have it down. One day I'll have a producer. I think Joshua LeBlanc is the perspicacious. Is that right, father? I can't read him. You can't read it. He's the. It's go ahead. Perspicacious and pernicious proprietor. He is the pers- perspicacious and pernicious proprietor. <laughs> cybercatholics.com he's at jr leblanc on twitter thank you joshua thank you as you know i didn't write your uh, your your title for this week uh father ryan's church is online at campy chat catholic champty catholic church.com it's a soft seat father yeah <laughs> all of his personal posts are on twitter he's at fr humphreys thank you father to ryan hey it's been a blast <laughs> chore welcome <laughs> <laughs> And you know me, I'm Father Chris Decker, and you can find me on Twitter if, if you really want to. Uh, I'm, oh dear, I'm, I've turned off the screen. <laughs> I can't do it. This is not going well, folks. Um, I'm Father Chris Decker. Oh dear. It's just gone. <laughs> I'm Father Chris Decker. You can follow me on Twitter, at Digital Catholic. Thanks for tuning in and hanging around this digital continent. CatholicUnderground.com, where faith gone digital. We'll see you next time.